First of all, welcome to everybody, and so glad that you decided that this is where you wanted to be for these moments. Uh, we don't take it for granted that you are here. We're glad that you decided to come for whatever reason, and uh, we, we hope that uh, what we do here is uplifting in the sense of encouragement and help. Uh, just a quick two-word lesson. Some people say, oh, I'm not religious. I love it when they say that. Because you see, every last human being is hardwired to be spiritual. And so people will say, you know what, I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. Your being here today signifies that you believe that coming to church is helpful to your spirituality. Because you see, the, the, little, the naughty little question that I like to ask is, if you don't come to church, are you going to hell? No. And 100% of the people that I have ever asked that question to have always said no. So then I get to ask my other little question. <laughs> you see, I, I, I like it because I, I, I know, I know I'm, leading, I'm leading people along. So why do you? So why, why, why did you? See, so if you think about that, if you came to church today because you wanted the opportunity in a congregative sense to worship God, if you wanted the opportunity to see a bunch of your friends and family and to encourage them in their relationship with God, their own spiritual connection, then you're in the right place at the right time. My hope, too, is that there are other places and other things and other situations that you will find yourself in that will also help you. Reading scripture yourself, praying yourself, meeting with other people who do that on a regular basis in smaller groups is another good way. And I know that a number of you are participating in those kinds of activities as well. These are support mechanisms for your spiritual life. Because as we know from the trainers who want to make us all fit and buff, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, that's what happens. And it's mental that this happens. It's physical that this happens. It's also social that this happens. So thank you. Thank you for deciding that coming and being a part of this church service would be helpful to you. So I begin with a smash-up derby. How's that? How many of you have ever been to a county fair? Okay, I, I know you Californians think that you're all cool to be living in L.A., but I do also know that there are Californians who wear cowboy boots and have horses. I think they live in Agua Dulce, right? Okay, and, and they have horses, and, and they, they know what a combine harvester is. And, you know, in fact, this morning, uh, Jordan uh, Thornburg was talking about the fact that there are farmers in the Napa Valley, and, of course, they farm grapes, but it's farming, and it's in the dirt, and so when they see, you know, preppy people coming from the west, uh, east rather, so sort of like, oh my goodness, what are you doing here? Uh, you know, they don't understand how hard we have to work here in the Napa Valley. Uh, they just see all the wealth. But it's work. It's hard work. And the people who work the dirt, the people that work the dirt in this country, they like to get together and they like to have fun. And oftentimes that's what happens at a county fair. Now, one of my favorite uh, parts about living in Ohio, now, now, now you know where this is going, right? Uh, the, my favorite parts about living on Fairgrounds Road, that was my address, six, number six, Fairgrounds Road. So you know what else was on that road, right? The fairgrounds. And uh, we, we used to ha have to make a decision. Are we going to be willing to listen to the noise of the fair the, uh, during the time that it was on? Or were we going to uh, go and do other things until late, late, late at night, until all the noise was finished, and then come back to our house? Well, I, you know, we just had that attitude, if you can't beat them, join them. So they used to give us tickets to go to the fair because right next to the fairgrounds was Mount Vernon Academy. This is an academy that the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church had been in operating since the 1890s. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful grounds. Uh, unfortunately, closed uh, a couple of school years ago, but uh, is right next to the fairgrounds. And so in exchange for allowing people to park on the grounds of the academy, they would give those of us who worked in the area for the church, they would give us tickets, and so we would go. And my favorite night, my favorite night of all, was the smash-up derby. <laughs> this is the moment when uh, great, and I mean the bigger the better, great old American cars would be repurposed. They would be, they would be made into these, these behemoths where oftentimes the hood would be ripped off so that the engine in all its glory could be seen. The muffler system would be severed with a hacksaw and onto that would be welded pipes that would go straight up in the air so that as he revved the engine, you could see the, you could see the flames coming out of the top of the engine. And then there would be all sorts of amazing paint jobs that probably didn't come from a spray can. They probably came from house paint or something else. Numbers would be put on. Wheels would be painted in all kinds of garish colors. And then extra bumpers would be put on because this was going to be a duel to the death. <laughs> and you wanted to protect your engine. You wanted to protect your flanks. You wanted to protect your rear end. Because the fact was that when the, when the, when the beep went, when the loud noise, the, the starter went, then would begin the crashing. And from all sides, people would spin dirt and would ram into each other. It was fabulous. I loved it. And you would watch as people would deploy various kinds of, of strategies as to how to win those guys that had those huge, big American cars with the huge trunks. They used those trunks as battering rams. They would reverse into people because that was smart. You weren't going to be crashing your radiator. You were going to be crashing your, your back end. And so you'd see these cars now that, that looked like ants going around with their rear ends in the, in, in the air because they'd crashed their rear end and popped it up. You'd see cars that would go up on top of each other and then come off. It was, it was so amazing, so wonderful. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that's my boy from Pennsylvania right there. He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I never did make it to the Combine Harvester smash up, but they do have such a sport where they take old and now used Combine Harvesters and run them into each other until they don't go anymore. Can, can you? I mean, it's hard for us city folk to understand this, but. You know, when you sit for hours and hours and hours in a combine harvester, you probably, that's all you probably want to do is run that thing into a brick wall and say, I don't want to be here anymore. I just want to smash it up. It's marvelous. It's marvelous to see. And when we would, we would see someone smash into someone else's gas tank and there would be a bit of an explosion and then there would be the fire truck that would, you know, was right on the side waiting for such a moment we would watch the firemen run out there and put out the fire, and the person, of course, had to be pulled out of the car. And I don't think I ever saw any fatalities. I don't think I ever saw any major injuries. There was just a lot of fun crunching up good old American iron and having, having a good time. Some of you know that, that, that Chris and I like Oswald Chambers. He's a, he's a commentator. He has written a lot, and his works have been put into pithy little uh, one or three paragraph statements. Oswald Chambers describes this event right here that we now celebrate with a, a piece of cloth that sig is significant of the, the clothes that Jesus left behind in the tomb after he was resurrected. He talks about this event as the colliding, the colliding of sin. You, should, you, could, you could also put in there rebellion against God. The colliding of that and God. Sin and God collided at the cross and there was a huge crash. And God won. 
God won. Sin, sin was vanquished. Sin was no more. It was as if it, it, they, they'd hit radiators and, and God had this huge bumper and he had just absolutely smashed the engine of sin and so they could no longer go. The, the car was dead and out comes the tow truck, which happened so many times in this event. Everybody goes to the side while the dead ones in the middle, the dead cars that cannot move anymore, whose transmissions are gone or whose axles are broken, they all get dragged off the, the battlefield. Well, sin, the rebellion of humanity, was dragged off of the battlefield when Jesus came and of his own decision, of his own power, he lays down his life. Let's not forget this. I, I try to emphasize it. And, and when I hear you uh, telling me, I'll know that you have remembered. Rome did not kill Jesus the Jews did not kill Jesus. Jesus told his own disciples, I will lay down my life and I will take it up. We're talking about the Almighty God. We're talking about Jesus being 100% God and 100% human at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's a mystery. It's the mystery of the incarnation. But that is what happened at the cross. This moment where Jesus lays down his life and then later on, three days later, he rises up again. This is his power. This is his doing. This is his plan. This is the plan that God had to save humanity and sin Sin dies. The crash. This puts us into an interesting situation, though. Theologians, or people who, who study the God stuff in the world, want to tell us that because of this event, we are saved. But then the more realistic amongst us say, yes, we we, we have salvation. We are, we are saved. That's a, that's a technicality because, in fact, <laughs> we're, we're still here. This is, this is the reality of our situation. We are still here on earth. And as the psalmist says, David says, we live in the valley of the shadow of death. And if you don't believe about death... <laughs> then, you know, just talk to some of us who, who have recently been to a funeral. And we can tell you, death is still taking our loved ones away from us. We live in the land of the shadow of death. So how can you tell me that, that, that be, you know, Jesus has all... Well, this is what the theologians say. We live in a time when there has already been salvation granted to humanity, but that we have not yet received the transformation that we will need in order to live physically in the presence of Almighty God. So it's, it's, it's this tension, it's this tension between the already and the not yet. So if you can, if you can hold that concept in your mind, you understand that, that this, is the, this is the real situation. Even though there was a, a crash up between God and sin that happened at the cross, the rest of the story is still playing out and we haven't come to that time, we haven't come to that place where sin and death have been totally eradicated and there's no more of that anymore because, as I just put it in, in, in my own terms because I'm a simple man, uh, the big change... The big change hasn't happened yet. So we, we, live, we live with this tension. So this is where the Apostle Paul comes to us as a, as a teacher. We call him a, a, an apostle, but just understand that when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and told him, look, dude, you are kicking against me. Paul, Paul kind of looks up into this bright light. He's, he's blinded. He says, well, who, who are you? And, and, and Jesus says, I am Jesus, and you are persecuting me. 
by going after my people, you are persecuting me. Paul is blinded, as you remember, and then he goes to Damascus. He is then healed. Some of us believe that he was not healed completely and that ever after that he was somewhat blind, not completely able to see. He goes off into the wilderness, not for one year, not for two years, but for three years he goes off into the wilderness. And as I say it, he had his hard drive reformatted. Because as a rabbi, he, he would have known all of the Hebrew scriptures. He would have known them by heart. They would have all been up here. He didn't have to carry the scrolls with him because he had them memorized. And so he goes through in his mental uh, computer, he goes through everything that has happened uh, now that he realizes that this event, that he is, is going after the people who believe in this event, he realizes that at this event, sin has collided with God and God has sent his Messiah, God has sent his plan, God has sent his Jesus into this world to save us from sin, humanity. And so he's going through the Hebrew scriptures and he's realizing that everything fits. What was foretold that would happen was now already past. It has happened. And so this is why he can come to the disciples later on and be introduced as he was by Barnabas, son of encouragement. Barnabas introduces him to these people who are still afraid of him because he was the persecutor of Christians and say, look, I have had time with Jesus. He has spoken directly to me and now I am a believer. This, this person that, that I did not believe in, now I believe in. For Paul himself, he had had this crash up that had happened with his own understanding and with God. God had directly influenced him and that is why he claimed to be an apostle is because he had met Jesus personally through vision. He comes now and he says in his uh, huge big book that he writes to his friends in Rome, the church in Rome, he writes to them and he says in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, that he, we, we now, he's saying we now, are justified through faith. Okay? And, 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 th and this is, my friends, this is jargon. This is biblical. Uh, what, what does it mean to be justified? Are, are we secretaries and we're, we're justifying a margin? Uh, you know, we're, we're putting something right. We know that that's what it means to be justified. But when we use this in the, in the, in the Christian context, what, simply put, we, we were out of whack with God. We were separated from God. And Jesus comes and he reconnects us. Come on, that's, that's easy to understand, right? It's way, way, way easier than justification. Dun, dun, dun. You know, so just clear away all the baggage that comes with that and realize that Jesus came to give us a new connection to God. Sin, my simple version, okay? Sin is disconnection. When we pull out and say, no, I want to do this my way, that's whatever happens after that. Those are sins. Does that make a difference? Maybe you do too, between sin and sins. Sin is this state of being. Sins are those things that you do when you're in that state of being. When you're in a state of disconnection from God, the only thing that you can do is to rebel against God. When you're in a state of connection to God, then you do the things that He directs you to do. Is that, is that easy? When I plug my vacuum cleaner in to the electric, it works according to the way that it was supposed to work. If I disconnect it from the electric, it doesn't work. It rebels against my command to suck up the dirt in my house. The only way it's going to suck up the dirt is if I stick it into the electric and it works the way that it was designed to work. Same with us. When we are connected to God, 
We work according to the design that he had for us. We are no longer rebelling against and saying, I don't want to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. Paul says, we're done with doing it our own way. We now have been reconnected with God. And as such, we do so because we have faith. Because none of us have seen God. We have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus died. And that he died, and that his sacrifice is for me. This is a very personal thing. It's not even a corporate thing. It's a very personal thing. I can't do it for my children. My children can't do it for me. You can't do it for your friends. It's a very personal thing that we accept this reconnection to God personally through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he uses another term here that is access. Now, when I think of access, I think of like big rock concerts or, or uh, huge gatherings like Oshkosh. Oshkosh is a, is a place in Wisconsin where thousands of pathfinders, young people in a scout-like organization, gather together every five years. And it's really cool if you have the big, huge, plastic, all-access pass. Let me tell you, that's the swag you want when you go to when you go to Oshkosh. And uh, let's just say I've been a, a few times, and uh, uh, I got one of those, and it was really cool because you see, there's security around, right? And and so when you go backstage, and you can step up to security, and they see all access, they just welcome you right on in. It's a really great feeling when you know that there are 37,000 of your friends out there that didn't get to go backstage. Nah, 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 nah. I, I don't know if Paul was thinking that when he wrote this, <laughs> but I was. when I read this in Romans chapter 5, he says that through Jesus, we have gained access. We are allowed in. We're allowed in through the blood of the Lamb. Now, uh, those of you who didn't come last week, we, we had a Passover communion on Passover, which is a Jewish festival, and also we had communion, which is a Christian festival, a Christian doing, which many churches, in fact, the church that meets here tomorrow, will have communion right here. They do it every Sunday and they break bread, and they drink wine, and they, they have communion. We saw last week that, that those two things, the bread and the grape juice, because we use grape juice, represent the pieces of that service that God gave to the Israelites and that was pointing towards Jesus as being the Passover lamb. He comes and he pulls out the bread and the wine, and he says, this is my body. And he says, this is my blood. Th these are the emblems that represent me. And then, as we know, uh, not a few hours later, he is hung on a tree, he is hung on a cross, and he dies as the Passover lamb. And so every time he says, do this in remembrance of me, do this in remembrance of me, because Jesus became the portal. Jesus became the door. Some of you know this, but some of you don't, so I'll tell you. At the very moment that Jesus died on Friday afternoon of Passover week in Jerusalem, there was another sacrifice that was going on. In fact, they didn't care that there were three people on a hill called Golgotha, and that one of them was the Son of God. They didn't care. They were going about business as usual, and they were having the sacrifice that would happen once in the morning and once in the evening. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, at that very selfsame moment, when the priest was there with a knife to the throat of that perfect lamb, when he was going to sacrifice, he sacrifices that lamb, and suddenly there is a gigantic earthquake, 
And the Bible tells us too that uh, one, one of Jesus' friends writes about this, that the curtain, this, this thick tapestry that kept the holy, holiest of holies separated from the holy place. The, the priest is outside and he's, he's, he's about to kill this lamb. He's about to, and, and this earthquake comes. Maybe, maybe the lamb gets away. But what happens next is even more amazing to his ears in the rumbling of this situation. This curtain gets torn from top to bottom. Not by human hand. Because you see, Jesus, Jesus is that door. Jesus is that curtain. Jesus is that, that portal that grants us access into the very presence of God. Inside the holiest of holies, it's, it's, it's a two-apartment temple. You have the you have the bread on the one side and you have the candlestick on the other and then you had the altar of incense in front of the, 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 the curtain and, and it's woven and it has gold thread and it's very beautiful and, 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 and then on the other side you have the Ark of the Covenant. That's all you have in there. And inside that you have the Ten Commandment pieces and you have the, the manna and you have Aaron's rod that budded. You know, these, these are the things that you have inside the holiest of holies. And you have the two angels on top. Specific. If you want to know what's very important to God, look at what he gives specific instructions for in the Bible. And you know his instructions about how to build the tabernacle, how to build the temple, were very, very specific. And he said, I've got some people that I've chosen who have skills in doing exactly the kind of work that we need. Skills in building things with wood. Skills with building things with, with gold and with bronze. Choose those people because I've given them special skills and they're going to make these things because these things will represent uh, the kind of person that I am. So he has the two covering cherubs on the side of this box. And that when he came and he, his presence was inside that temple, there would be smoke because you see, God, God cannot be described in human terms. And so all we know about God visiting his people is that it was glorious and that there was, there was, there was smoke and there was, there was this Shekinah glory. Well now, the curtain gets torn. And you can be that priest with me today. You're at the outside of the temple and now you're looking through, you're looking through the holy place. The bread's there, the, 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 the candlestick is there, the altar of incense. And maybe the altar of incense gets knocked over because now the curtain is open. And for the first time, maybe for that priest, you are seeing the very throne of God. Paul says, we are justified. We are, we are put right by believing in Jesus as our Lord. And through that belief, through Jesus' actions, not our actions, but through Jesus' actions, we are granted access into the very presence of God. So please, you don't need me to pray for you. Oh, but pastor, uh, you, you're closer to God. Really? You don't know the wickedness of my heart. You don't know the... I am a sinful, broken human being just like you. My job is to encourage you to have a personal relationship with the Father. To have nothing in between. And guess what? Jesus has given us that ability because he died and the door was opened and into the presence of our Heavenly Father we can all go. In the name, the family name of Jesus. If you haven't plugged that into the third commandment, I'll do it for you right now. 
The third commandment in most Bibles <laughs> says, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Well, what if that's our family name? It would be easy to understand that as a patriarch in a family, as a leading person in a family, you would say to your son or to your daughter, please don't do anything that's going to make our family look bad. Maybe you've even heard that from your parents. Don't become part of our family and then turn around and do something that makes our family look bad. That's the third commandment. You thought it was all about you know, saying the name of Jesus as a curse word. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a nasty thing. Some people, that's all they know about the name of Jesus, is that they use it as an expletive or an expletive. And it's, it's, you know, it has a certain ring to it. Jesus Christ. It, you know, kind of makes your mouth feel good when you say it. And if you say it really loud, it, it makes you feel even better. Kind of like some other words that we tend to use a lot. That's why we use them, because they make us feel better somehow. But it's not that really that's being talked about here. It's, it's honoring this person who has now given us full access into the family of God. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name. We pray in the family name. We are justified through faith and we are granted access in which, Paul says, we now stand. So if you didn't believe me before when I told you that I believe that the kingdom of heaven is here, please understand that Jesus was the one who said that and now Paul is saying it again. So I get to say it again. The kingdom of heaven has been has broken into, if you like, has, has descended in the form of Jesus and has broken into human history and given us the ability through Jesus, through this portal, to be in the very presence of our Father, the Creator God of the universe. Paul says that, that this gives way to hope. And let me tell you, when you are standing with those who don't understand this, and they are standing next to someone that they have lost to death, there is such a hopelessness I mean, you don't even have to touch them, but you can feel it. There is an abject misery in belief that this is the end. Never will I see this person again. Paul says, no, no. Because we have faith in this saving grace of God, this plan of salvation, because we have faith in that, we have been granted access into this kingdom. Because of that, we know that the promises of Jesus are true, because he says, when I go to prepare a place for you, John chapter 14, I will come back and get you. Christians are not the only ones who believe that Jesus is going to come back. There are millions of other people in the world that are looking for a Savior. Millions who are not Christian. They want the hope too. They want to know that even though we live in this already and not yet. That Jesus has made a way. And that you can live in this tension by being inside the gate. Uh, Chris, as we were discussing this, Chris brought up C.S. Lewis and the whole idea of the room, the, 
the shed in the last book of his trilogy, uh, excuse me, of his, his whole series, The Chronicles of Narnia, where the inside of the room is a whole lot bigger than what the shed looked like from the outside. Kind of is like Jesus saying, you know, you don't even have any idea about the kingdom of heaven. You don't know. Just follow me and I will take you there. I'm going to prepare a place for you to be there so that where I am, there you will be. That's all that the promise says. It doesn't say what it's going to be like exactly. It just says we're going to be there together with God. This week I had to, uh, not had to, but I chose to attend a, 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 a seminar in Long Beach put on by the Pacific Union of Seventh-day Adventists. And um, we, had, we listened to, to several preachers that were, were very good. And uh, the, one guy, the one guy was elaborating on, on this, whole, this whole topic. And the idea that, 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 that he brought is that, that our imagination is so small that we better just accept, we better just accept that he is almighty God and that he knows so much more than we know that yes, Heaven is going to be so much more than we can imagine, like Chronicles of Narnia. The box is bigger inside than it looks like on the outside. I, I, I want to see. I want, I want to see inside the box. Don't you? <laughs> Jesus has made a way for us to get inside and to be a part of his kingdom now and to live now as if we are part of his kingdom, even though, tension, remember, tension, even though we still reside physically in the valley of the shadow of death. I hope I didn't just confuse you after all the work I've done. This is the tension of the already and the not yet. That we can be citizens of the kingdom of God, but still here on this earth before the big change. And that he can still be our leader and that he says now, here, here, here's the tough part, that we should be rejoicing in the sufferings that we go through. I, I, I'd like to take out the word suffering because it, maybe there's a synonym that, that would be easier. How about experience? Because experiences can be positive and negative. Suffering is just like only negative. Isn't that what we feel? We, 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 we think of sufferings as only bad. What if we had to say that our experiences here on this earth, while we are waiting, develop perseverance. That's what Paul says. He develops perseverance, and perseverance develops our character. And our character then is hopeful. So if you're saying, Pastor, because of the, the week that I just had, or the stuff that I'm facing in the future, I, I just don't know if I can be hopeful. Hang in there, sister. Hang, hang in there, brother. Because Paul is saying, this experience that you're having is going to develop perseverance in your life. And the, the Spirit of God living in you is going to be giving you the strength to deal with the difficulties of having to live still in the valley of the shadow of death with all of its troubles and all of its craziness. It's crazy out there. Okay? Okay? When people decide that they are going to live for themselves, guilty, you end up doing some crazy stuff that you know is not going to be something that God is happy about. Isn't that why we come to church? We come to church because we need somebody to say, can I pray for you? Can I, can I bear your burdens? That's why I love church. Because we get to encourage each other. Because we are going through sufferings. We are having to persevere. We are having to, to, to dig deep. We are having to trust. These are difficult things for everybody. But together we can encourage each other and keep each other accountable to the fact that we live in, because of the cross, we live in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. What's coming after the big change, I believe it's going to be amazing. I believe that there is nothing in this 
part of my experience that is going to compare to the second part of my eternal experience. And therefore, I say, as I've said before, ain't nothing going to keep me from experiencing that. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Nothing in this life that is going to keep me from saying yes to Jesus and his kingdom because that's the portal. That's what gets you in. If it's, if it's your desire to, to be a part of, of this kingdom and or to say this week, I know last week is gone and, and we can't do anything about last week, but this week coming up, what about, what about you saying with me, Jesus, I need your help to live in the already and the not yet, in this tension, this tension of waiting for you to come. I need your help. I can't do it myself. Anyone else want to say yes? You want to say, yeah, that's me. Jesus, please help me this week. Amen. Amen. May you be blessed. May you experience his love. May you be part of those who show his love to all those around who are hopeless. And that as a result of being in your presence, others will know Jesus more. Amen.